Hello and welcome to the show. In the late 70s and 80s, few bowlers were as feared as Australia's own Rodney Hogg. Jeff Hutchison went out to see if he still has that sting in his tail. Over there, in the pavilion, the bloke putting the pads on looks a little nervous about the bowler he'll soon be facing. Someone asks, how many overs does he usually have? But no one answers. They know the mystery man in question may not need very many. It's a bit of an, bit of an animal. He hit a bloke last week, so... Did he? Yeah, but we did uh, say to the bloke, go get a helmet, but he, he wasn't in it. So where'd he hit him? In the head. Sorry about this, guys. It's very embarrassing. Which end, Rob? Forced me out of the game. <laughs> Smitty, what end are you bowling from, Smitty? <laughs> you playing Smitty or what? He still has the barrel chest and those chicken legs, but don't tell him I told you. For at 46, Rodney Hogg is as scary as he ever was. There's the hook. I've got a bit of a reputation as bowling, um, bowling too many bounces and swearing too much, and uh, I suppose I don't think that's the right way to play cricket. He was possessed by white line fever, asthma attacks, which occasionally took him off the ground when he felt like it, and the odd difference of opinion with his captains. But he also possessed a delivery that was quick and straight and devastating every time an Englishman stood at the other end. I watch a lot of cricket these days and, and they've sort of gone away from bowling short stuff and intimidating bowling and I, I think that's a way to get guys out. But there are a percentage of players around now who don't like the short stuff. So to me, why not bowl short to them? Hogg reckons he used up all his lucky coupons in those series against England. Bowling to the great Viv Richards was an altogether different test. Caught behind, Richards goes. I remember bowling a short ball to Viv and hitting him flush on the cheek, and the ball rolled back down the wicket, and Viv just looked at me as if nothing had happened. I thought, well, that's, <laughs> that's it for me. And he yeah, hit, the, hit I, the next ball? Next ball, top edge, edge it for six, and, I, and I, I thought then, well, you know, the ball that hit Viv in the, it, on the cheek would have put my, would have put you in hospital, would have put uh, most people in hospital for sure, because uh, it was just such a hard blow straight on the cheek, and, and when the ball rolls back to you, you know you've hit him flush. Rod Hogg was 27 when he played his first test. In all, there were just 38. He took 123 wickets, but just seven years after he started, it was all but over. And that perhaps explains why he's still playing this year for the Fern Tree Gully Laugh at the Name Mate Noldecia Bluebirds. You must love bowling at, at 46 to still want to come out and spend your Saturday afternoons yeah. playing cricket. Yeah. Not too many blokes who played at the highest level are playing cricket 10 years afterwards. Yeah, well, I get a buzz out, you know, it's still a little bit of white line fever. I uh, control myself. I don't swear at umpires anymore or go off at the batsman, but. Uh, Still a bit of white line fever and still enjoyment. At, um, the injury side of things where you, you can't run a lap or your calf's going, this sort of old age uh, injuries, they, uh, they take their toll a bit. But um, I'd rather do that than probably hit a golf ball at the moment or, or play, uh, as Mum keeps telling me, play lawn bowls. Has he ever told you if there was any truth in the rumour about him wanting to take Graham Yallop behind the, the grandstand? And, and Can you imagine him? Hoggy doing something like that? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, easy. Yeah, he's got that, uh, the eyes. The Madness eye. in the eyes? Yeah. Was that Dinkum? Were you going to wallop him that day? Oh, look, not really. I guess at the time he was uh, uh, inexperienced with the captaincy and I was in inexperienced with the pressures of um, test cricket and, and it just uh, might have come to a bit of a head at the Adelaide Oval, but um, that, to me that's long forgotten. It may still live with Graham a bit. Does he ever walk off the ground in the middle of the over like he did in the old days? No, Does not he? yet, not yet. Huh? It was only halfway through the season though. Yeah. I was a believer then, you've got a 12th man, he's a better fielder, you're not bowling, why would you be on the ground? Why wouldn't you use your 12th man more? Did your captain share that view, do you think? Because not well, many captains would have shared that view, would they? I was allowed off a few times. A field for a leg before he's out. When I was young, I used to get bored in the field and just uh, stand around and yell out, what about a bowl sort of thing, but as time's gone on, I've learnt that um, want the ball to come to you. If you want the ball to come to you, every ball, get involved. I suppose uh, perhaps I might be a bit more of a team man now. I wasn't a team man when I was younger. In defence, 
of Graham Yallop. Would you have been a pretty hard bloke to captain in the young in your young days? Get bored in the field, shout um, out, I want to have a bowl. Look, um, why do you have to get back to Graham Yellow? That's, hey, give us a break, All geez. right. Rod Hogg smiles easily and often, but only a fool would press on the moment it fades. And today at the Belgrave Footy Club, the madman stare is at work again. We won't get a wicket today. Batsmen flinch and flutter at balls they haven't even seen. And Hoggy's mates in the outfield look on, trying to mask their admiration. Just hope you can stand up for the rest of the year, that's all. Okay. Injury free and we should go all the way. And then the rain came and so too the sighs of relief from the pavilion. For Rod Hogg wouldn't get anyone out today. And if it still seems strange he was even here in the first place, Hoggy will tell you he was always more at home just playing the game. Did you like playing in test matches at the MCG and having big sections of the crowd shouting your name out? No, not at all. Not at all? No, hated that. I just, uh, I like bowling. Because you didn't smile much, did you? No, no. I'd rather go down a fine league and have no one there than have a crowd. I know Max Walker loved, uh, he'd have 10,000 people down there cheering. That wasn't my cup of tea, no. I'd rather just bowl and go down a fine league and not have one person there. Great delivery there from Rodney Hogg. Well, that's well taken. So Chris Cairns has finally got the breakthrough and he's done it by bowling the perfect length. Finally, Chris Cairns is content, comfortable with his place in sporting history and injury free. Well, almost. He's copped some criticism over the years, both at home in New Zealand and abroad, for failing to perform when the team needs him most. Back in 1993, few will forget how he succumbed to injury in the Test Series against Australia, and after sitting out the second, struggled with one for 128 in the final test at the Gabba. Sometimes I've, co I've copped a lot of flack because um, I'm in a position where uh, I can hold my place in the team as a batter. Um, and then if I get injured and not able to bowl, I'm still, still around. Whereas if a, if a bowler gets injured, they're off, you know, they're gone, they're away from the public eye and then they're, they're, you know, nowhere to be seen so they can get right and get fixed. But, you know, I tend to hang around like a bad smell, you know, I'm sort of, I'm there playing as a batter, doing my thing, but people are saying, well, why isn't he bowling? And, you know, and, and I get frustrated and my teammates get frustrated with it. And uh, so that's been difficult as well. Chris Cairns has grown up trying to deal with other people's high expectations. It's just the way it is when you're the son of a cricketing hero like Lance Cairns. A mighty all-rounder who produced a thrilling knock of six sixes for a total of 52 off 25 balls at the MCG against Australia in the summer of 82-83. Chris made his test debut against Australia in season 89-90. In fact, the Cairns hold the world record for the shortest time between father and son playing test cricket something Australians have ensured Chris will never forget. I read an article in one of the uh, magazines on the, on the plane and it said uh, every time I, I see Chris Cairns come out to bat I, I wish his hips were broader, his arms were thicker and, and, uh, and I wish that he was Lance. And so th they have a real affinity with the old man, you know. I suppose I'm a bit more refined, you know, I'm uh, technically, well sometimes technically, um, a bit more proficient than what he was. Um, and, you know, I, I'm still paving my way. Um, Dad had, that was his third tour of Australia that he sort of made his name. So hopefully I've got a bit, a bit of stuff left in me this summer to, uh, to say that, uh, yeah, Lance could play, but yeah, Chris wasn't bad. Gone, yes! He went again, Cairns doing the damage. At 17, Chris was playing English county cricket for Nottinghamshire, at 18 for New Zealand. A year later, when legendary fast bowler Sir Richard Hadley decided to call it quits, the people of New Zealand called out for a new hero. They settled on the son of Lance Cairns. Pressure, young Chris, could have well done without. 
It's like you guys, the Australians, with Lily, you know, when he retired and they were searching Craig McDermott and they went through sort of quite a few fast bowlers during that era to look for, for someone to replace. But, you know, you, you can't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ne not as good a bowler as Richard Hadley and, uh, you know, I never will be. Um, but m I'm a different type of player. My, my batting is better than what his was. And, um, and so I'm sort of more balanced, hopefully, rather than, you know, leaning towards the bowling or the batting. It's sort of more of a combined effort. Still, Chris was constantly under public scrutiny and with the added workload of his county commitments, failed to really make an impact on the international game. When I look back on it, um, I, I was injured in my first test match um, against the Australians. And I had a, 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 about a year out and, you know, that was frustrating and then I tried to come back again and, and you know, injuries sort of... Um, in between that and going to England and playing a lot of county cricket and you know my, my, my test career or international career hasn't really got started uh, up until a couple of years ago and uh, it was pretty frustrating that I was putting a lot of my effort into to first class games but not international games. Steve Rickson's arrival in 1996 marked a new beginning for Chris Cairns. An ongoing dispute with former coach Glenn Turner not only damaged his career but shattered any hope of team stability let alone success. We had a huge clash and once again um, it, it affected the team. It, it, it wasn't a personal thing, well it was a personal thing, but um, it got outside of us and it affected the team and, and that's the worst thing. Um, his style was a style of complete managerial arrogance I suppose where um, he tried to shape everybody into something they weren't and instead of getting the best out of everybody, um, using everyone's talents and bringing that out um, which is the great thing about Steve Rickson, you know, and uh, he just sees, sees what he's got um, and uses that. On again, McGrath the chaser. To be his best on the field, Chris Cairns has also had to deal with tragedy away from the game. In 1993, his sister was killed in a freak train accident in New Zealand. It's a situation where it was so... Um, I mean, the odds of it happening are just un unbelievable, and you sort of think, well, you know, if, uh, you know, if you believe in destiny or fate or anything like that, then you think, well, I've I've got to do what I've got to do. And sure, that, I mean, that does uh, come through in my attitude and, and how I play, and um, which you know I think has affected me indirectly. And he's out, caught behind. Perhaps now New Zealand's brightest cricketing sun is really ready to shine. Adversity may have threatened him along the way, but it also taught him well. Yeah, I've had some bad times, you know, um, off the field and on the field. I've, uh, I've suffered some, some bummer losses and some bummer times. And I think we've got a group of guys together now who if we keep together and with a coach um, and a management team that's in place now, we can have some good times. And, you know, you, 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 if we can just have a couple of years, you know, where things go well, then all that crap's worthwhile, you know, it really is. And uh, so that's what you keep going. And that's what I keep going for because I'd like one day to see New Zealand cricket respected in Australia because then I know we've made it. Well, there's heaps more cricket show to come, so don't go away. This is something that is passed on from generation to generation. Through the centuries it has gone on. The testing ground of sportsmen and sportsmanship. And through the centuries to come, may it still go on. The bond of sporting friendship that helps unite an empire and remain forever what it is today, the king of sport. He's bowled him! He's bowled him! The last ball of the day, Lily. Back, finding the inside edge and bowling out for Richard. We're at the Kingsgrove Sports Centre looking for bats, and there's one bat that I know you won't be taking to the crease this season. This Don Bradman collector's item. Harry, each year Don Bradman brings out another collector's bat. What makes this one so special? This one is special, uh, Michael, because it is the start of a new series of bats. That's the Bodyline series bat, personally signed by Don Bradman, and the numbers are limited to just 300 bats. 300 bats. You've got number two. Have you got number one as well? Well, not really. Probably the Bradman Museum would have one. I'm happy to have number two. Well, it makes sense. You'll also find his career statistics around the outside. 
So something for the real collector. They're going to be hard to find, but if you're after something like this, good luck. A new bat to the market, the Newbury Majolna. Very meaty, chunky bat from England. OK, what does Majolna mean? Means the god of thunder. <laughs> you sure about that? Well, that's what it is. It's a very chunky bat made famous by many English players. OK, so it's at the upper end of the market? Certainly, top end of the market, an excellent bat for the hitters. OK, traditional bat, a new one for this year's market. I hope this helps. And in Perth, Murph Hughes is on his way to perhaps the most unusual test hat-trick in the history of the game. Removing Kirtley Ambrose with the last ball of an over, getting Patrick Patterson That's with the out. first ball of his next to end the innings, and then taking the new ball in the West Indies' second innings. And he's got it. Murph Hughes, a hat-trick. Hughes had become only the fifth Australian to achieve the feat. It arrived in three overs and took two days. We're at the Arden Street ground in North Melbourne, and cricket lovers will recognise a vaguely familiar form at the crease. His name is Asanka Gurusinha, and this is what he did to Australian bowlers a couple of years ago. That's well hit. And over the boundary. The Guru is in his second season of Melbourne District Cricket. Like many of his countrymen, this place is home now. But what separates him from them is the fact he's played 41 test matches, scored seven test hundreds, and been vice-captain of his country. That's a beautiful shot. Four runs straight along the ground. But sadly, a combination of fickle Sri Lankan cricket politics and a bad relationship with Arjuna Ranatunga has brought an international career to an early end. It's not a new thing that uh, Arjuna and I didn't get on well, especially the 95, 96 Australian tour where they thought I'm close to the Australian team. I wasn't close, they were friends. And after the game, I had a drink with them or went out for dinner with Ian Healy, which was mainly Ian Healy, which, which I was very close to. And they didn't like it. So I said, look, during the game, I play hard. But after the game, what I do is, it's my business. The 1995-96 series with Sri Lanka was acrimonious. First, there were the allegations of ball tampering in the first test in Perth. International umpire Kaiser Hyatt and Peter Parker kept a close eye on the condition of the ball. It was then brought to the attention of the Sri Lankan skipper Ranatunga, who was not impressed. To tell the truth, we never tampered with the ball. I can tell now because I'm, I'm retiring. I'm, I've retired, announced my retirement, so we never did that. And then accusations that spinner Mataya Murali Dharan was a chucker. More than 50,000 spectators were stunned when umpire Darrell Hare no balled Sri Lankan spinner Muralitharan seven times. So he's called that one. Then we came into this game in Melbourne, then it was, it was throwing, which we thought, look, he's not. So uh, it was very disappointed to, for people to call us cheats, and sometimes when you're walking, Certain Australians used to call us, hey, you cheats. So he used to turn back and said, look, we didn't cheat, but that's all we could do. What else could Guru do but go out and produce the innings of his career? There it is. That's 100, and what better way to bring it up with a pull shot like that? Guru Singer, his seventh test century for Sri Lanka. But still, the ill feeling remained, and today, he still regrets it. The two teams never talked. They never had a drink after a game. They never sp spoke to each other, except for Mark Taylor talking to Arjuna during the toss. That was the only time. And uh, the two boards got in involved in it at the end to settle this. And when they settled it, uh, it was at the last test match in Adelaide, where Taylor walked in with the team to have a drink. But it was too late. It was just like a war. It doesn't bounce, and that was very painful. The Australians were wary about playing in Sri Lanka during the last World Cup, and the guru understood better than most. In 1994, he not only had his house stoned and his wife attacked, there was even a threat to kidnap his son. Why? 
because he refused to pull out of a tour of Sharjah in protest at the surprise omission of Aravinda da Silva. Cricket politics in Sri Lanka can have a rather dangerous edge. Went back to Colombo for about two weeks. We were living with police security in, in Sri Lanka. I mean, just imagine <laughs> what can we do? And my, uh, then we were getting telephone calls and letters and it was threatened, they were threatening us, I don't know who. And then at the end, they gave a call and said, we are going to kidnap your son. And they mentioned his kindergarten school he was going to, the time he leaves his school. Then the person who called knew all the details. And I was not going to take any chances. And so the guru came to Melbourne and has officially announced his retirement from test cricket. It is an unsatisfactory end, but he hasn't given up on playing near the top level again. I still think there are about two, three years left in me to play at the highest level. And uh, I hope uh, one day I can play for Victoria here. Well, time's beaten us again on the cricket show. Tomorrow we trace the comeback of new test paceman Simon Cook. See you then. <laughs>